Well, hello and welcome to the Below the Rim show where we tackle some uh, some British basketball related uh, issues, topics, things that crop up on social media, reports that we've seen. And we're going to go straight into it by introducing you to the fellas first. My main man, Ads. How you doing, man? And uh, we'll do it in, in the traditional order. My main man, Daz, back on the show. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Yeah, he's back. I'm back. <laughs> nice. Hi. I hope you're well. That's, this is so, this is nice. Good man. Trying to get and... the respect I deserve around here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about Josh. Josh, how you been? Yeah, not too bad, son. You right? <laughs> He's literally going for it. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll kick things off. So, um, those of you who've been keeping abreast of things, not much else to do, is there at the moment in this current climate? The uh, former BBL director, David Lowe, was on Mark Woods' MVP cast with some choice words regarding the BBL's future, claiming it's close to liquidation. That's the first part we're going to discuss. We're also going to discuss his continued quest, him and the uh, the other owner of the, uh, uh, I nearly said Scottish Rocks, but I didn't, but then I did anyway, but the Glasgow Rocks, uh, for the BBL to grant them the league championship as Glasgow Rocks finished, or were top when the league finished abruptly due to COVID-19. Now, let's do the first bit first. Let's let's tackle the the BBL on potential liquidation claims. Uh, ads, we'll come to you, mate. I mean, it's there's always going to be, it's that sort of time of year where in normal times we'd sort of be, uh, well, we'd be post-season post now, wouldn't we? Um, no, we wouldn't. We'd be in, we'd be in the O2 now. What, mm. what day actually be, is it? We would be sat, <laughs> we would be, what? Yeah. We would be. I'd be on a train, getting just have got into London. I've been on tube right now. Yeah. Making my way to to the O2. So yeah. no, we'd we'd be in the finals day. Sorry. You're right. Me. You're right. So we're getting into that sort of fortnight where um, everybody does the sort of right. What happens next season? Type chat. Then it goes quiet for a little bit. Then everybody starts talking again. But this is obviously a different season completely so the thing with it is that is you know been the concern for me from day one with it all is the fact <laughs> that the amount of revenue being lost over the past few months for the bbl as a whole and we know that this weekend um i think perhaps we were talking about it this is the the big this is kind of where the league breaks even strokes sort of pushes itself into a, a profit situation financially mm. Because of huge amount of ticket sales for the O2, so with no games, nothing happening whatsoever, you know, it is worrying. There's rumours flying about, like the one that you just mentioned there. But this was kind of the first thing that I thought when this whole thing happened was this is going to be bad financially. So the question is, what what can be done? Because we're not in that sort of uh, in that world where. TV rights per se can save the day. Daz, my man. Um, yeah, as soon as as soon as the outbreak hit, we had that last hurrah in the uh, cup final, no trophy final, yeah, trophy final. And this was, I think, I know certainly the conversations I was having with people around the league, they were worried that it was going to go this way. So this isn't. <laughs> This isn't news, I don't think. This isn't shocking. Uh, it's sad if it does come to bear. Um, but I don't know where we're going to be able to go as a league without getting games on, you know. Mm. Um, there was something interesting said by David Lowe in that piece. He said about a rugby league style grant from the government because there's money available there to prevent uh, large institutions going, going out of business. Um, now, I don't know any of the the real background of that if the BBL have or haven't gone to government to go and get this grant I don't know but it's interesting that he made mention of rugby league obviously rugby league is, is a fantastic sport we're not here to run down other sports um, some people have a pop at netball but you know that's that's for Adam to do I mean that's for people to do um, but rugby is a great sport and it's played predominantly in North in these small former mining towns all this kind of business and they've got huge community engagement and and that's where I see basketball as well it's got such huge community engagement in a lot of areas where it's played and you look at who plays basketball especially um 
all over the country, actually. I was just looking, because we're going to get onto it later, the, the, the basketball scene in the north, northeast is absolutely amazing. So why can't BBL go to government and get some sort of grant or, or some kind of funding to, to tide them over for what they need during this corona window? Because of the huge work that the sport does in communities up and down the land, and it's not just about maintaining it at an elite level or a pro level, but that, again, it allows that pathway to exist for players. So it gives opportunity moving forward. And it would just undo about 30 years of good, bad and ugly work, but predominantly good. And that would be a real shame. So why, why can't that happen? I don't know. But it's something that needs to be uh, looked into if they aren't already. And I'm sure they are. There are you know, kind of people on that board. Josh, my man. Well, the news I've, I've been wanting to speak about is speculative and definitive. From what we know, the government's helped out a lot of businesses across the country through the furlough system. I've had conversations with two people. One person used to work in the British Basketball League and the other person currently works in. They have told me that the furlough system is working out okay. The question is, how long does that go for? Because I think the furlough system is going to ease down, I think, when it comes to September. So if the furlough system from the government has helped out some of these BBL clubs, say, pay for operational costs, pay for wages and salaries, okay, but it can't do that forever. And then the next question you've got to ask is, when the next season is supposed to come up, the 2020-21 season, are we going to be able to host another professional basketball season with the British Basketball League? Because by then, that's when they're really going to need to sell tickets. Yeah. I mean, it comes down to, you know, what Daz was saying there about stepping in and the government stepping in. This is going to be interesting for a number of reasons because everybody talks about the, the statistic of most participating sport for kids, blah, 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 blah. Hmm. This is really going to, for me, highlight how seriously the government sporting body takes the game of basketball right now and whether they do look at it and go, you know what, this is actually a really important sport within the UK sports culture and we need to protect, preserve, make sure that it does survive. And what would it do to the game if there was, even though it's, it's a small league, you know, it's not a, a massive multi-million pound um, business like the Premier League or anything like that. What, does it, what happens to the game if, they, if we do lose the, the professional league? Um, Obviously, then we still have National League, but that, again, isn't a financial package that, you know, draws in loads of, uh, loads of money and, and, and fan following. And, I mean, the BBL struggles to get coverage enough as it is in the mainstream, so the National League would struggle even more, probably. Um, it's pretty serious stuff, I think. It's really serious. Um, and with what's come out of, um, of Scotland today, or was it yesterday that the report came out? Or the, what we were referring to, Pops? Yeah, yesterday, I think. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, I mean, is it a bit of a scaremonger? You know, are we sensationalising a little bit? Or is, it, is, it, is this for real? I think that's important to note as well, is that none of it is, you know, none of it, like, like Josh said, it's, there's an element of speculation to it. People are trying to work out what because there's we've had reports that clubs are missing out on six figures and somebody said seven figures in return in in regards to to gate receipts and the money that they would recoup from that and and merchandise sales and things like that the bbl obviously is slightly different in a sense that they don't really rely on with the exception of obviously the the o2 the big the big sellout game at the end of the season which obviously we've said we would be at right now were it not for the lockdown um you wonder how much of it is true because obviously i would have thought obviously the furlough scheme is great and it seems to be working i'm i'm furloughed myself at the moment so you know the the implications of it are good because it means that companies can keep going during this time and then come back again but i would have thought we'd hear of teams folding before we heard of the league folding i don't know what you guys think of that well, I mean, it'd be a domino effect, wouldn't it? I mean, if, God forbid, teams did start folding, you'd have to look at it as to 
how many teams could you lose before you'd have to lose the league? In other words, we lose four or five teams, that takes it down to seven or eight. You know, you can't really host a competitive basketball league on, on eight teams. You know, I know British ice hockey suffers with a, with a lack of teams and, and, and a lot of games. And, it, and it's just that thing where if you've only got eight teams in a league that play each other eight times a season, you know, it's not really, really viable, is it? But I mean, if we look at it financially, I mean, I, I, does anybody know, this is a crazy thing that you would know, but what the average spend um, would be at a, at a regular BBL game? I'm, I'm just going to throw it out there. It's like, let's just say it's an average spend of maybe £10, something like that. You know, the highest attended games in Leicester, Newcastle, um, down in Plymouth, you're looking at, what, 2,000, 2,500, mm. something like that. So on a night based on that average, you're looking at, what, 25 grand. It's not a lot of money when you think about the fact that you've got to pay player salaries, you've got to pay the, the everyday running costs of the team. The worrying thing is, is that whilst this is going on without any ticket sales coming through for clubs, is, is literally, where's the money coming from? Because sponsors sure aren't going to be throwing money into it if, if, if they do uh, in a way where they'll give chunk sums of money each quarter of the season, maybe. But, you know, I've, I've heard somewhere as well that the main sponsors of the BBL um, could potentially have pulled out the minute mm. that the season was brought to a halt because they're going to say, well, you know, we're not going to keep putting money into something that isn't happening because we've got to protect our own backs. So unless somebody knows something we don't, there is no money going into the clubs at the moment. And if they are using the furlough scheme, what does that actually entail? And what do they base their numbers on to, to, to get that money through? Josh? No, I think you just summed it up right there. I mean, the furlough scheme, in my mind, probably what it covers are players' wages. Does it cover operation costs? I mean, technically, there's no events being hosted. Um, there's, um, sorry, um, Pabs, you might know this. The debate works. I was speaking to my dad about this, that it should be the goal of every, uh, every BBL team to try and build their own arena so there's little cost of hiring venues. Mm. But then I found out through someone that, in the case of, I think it's Plymouth Raiders, yeah, is that they have to sell out a certain amount of tickets at the pavilion, but anything extra, extra they keep as revenue. Yeah. So to my mind, how does their operation cost right now during this lockdown compare to someone like Leicester who have the Morningside Arena or Newcastle have their arena? What costs are they sort of having to pay when there's no events going down? That's the question. Mm. But I guess like, like you said, you, as you have, you have pretty much carved it all up there. Question is, is there something we don't know? Again, we can mm. only speculate. I mean, let's, let's look at, for example, one of the most expensive um, games to host, Daz, is surely the Lions. Because, yeah. I mean, what sort of deal do they have with Copperbox in terms of hosting the games there? Do they pay them a percentage of the ticket sales or is it a fixed fee? Uh, I, think, I think, as I understand, I could be wrong. Uh, I think it's a flat rate. And that is right. obviously not a cheap venue. Hmm. I'd imagine it's not, and especially with it being a, a venue in London as well. You know, that's yeah. going to be a, a big chunk of their revenue that comes in on game night. It's going to go straight to the copper box paying paying that. Does so, that mean they're, they're saving in terms of, they're not obviously they're not recouping any money from ticket receipts, but they're also not having to fork out to rent the venue in the first place? That's what I'm thinking. I mean... The, the, the first thing that happened, obviously, was when, when it all broke out, you know, most of the imports, the Americans and, and Europeans, were on the first thing smoking, you know, out of the UK. I know, you know, plenty of players um, up here in Manchester that I know that from, from overseas, it was literally, you know, text around going, what are you doing? What's happening? And, you know, I, I remember texting uh, my good friend Sam Roscoe and saying, um, what, where are you at? And she's like, I'm flying out the day after tomorrow back to Australia. It was a quick turnaround. So, you know, straight away, you know, you're thinking, well, the clubs have got to get the players back to, back home because they certainly can't afford to be paying the salaries and, and the, the expenses on having players over here 
whilst just nothing's going on. And if they haven't have done, look how long, how far into it are we now? A couple of months. Mm. Essentially, I'm going to speak for Manchester here, just knowing how they, they work. Um, they've got the guys in the house that they rent for the players. They still have to pay rent on the house. You know, they still have to fulfil their obligations to those guys. But with nothing coming in, what happens? So horrible as it was, there kind of had to be this sort of financial release of pressure by sending players back home to, to ease it up. Yeah. Daz, my man. I've not got a lot to add there, really. Um, yeah, a lot of the Europeans and Americans went home straight away. So that's going to have some sort of effect financially on the clubs. Um, I don't know if people are still getting paid. Who have gone home? Would players release some contracts and stuff like that uh, as it started to, to break down? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So there's, there's money off the books there. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the clubs and their Europe. British players rather aren't earning wild amounts of money anyway but like we've all said it's a case of money coming in versus money coming out and each club's going to be different hopefully clubs can stay afloat and uh, if the worst was to happen and the league wasn't to stay afloat you know hopefully the clubs can survive because a number of them have put themselves on decent footing I think it's fair to say mm. um, and especially with new ownership in Plymouth Manchester um, London who hopefully have sufficient money even through this to sustain whatever comes next if it's a Phoenix League if the National League gets a whole lot better um, remains to be seen but it's obviously awful times throughout the whole world and we're no exception to that I suppose in the British basketball I mean, any more, oh go on I was going to say any more comments before we move on but go on so I was going to say, is there any scope that at some point we could even tap up an owner or, or someone in higher places at a club and get them on and, and talk to them about how it has been, you know, and hear it from the horse's mouth? As it were. Well. You know, it'd be, it'd be really interesting to, yeah, to well. hear what the so owner... Something to look into, we all know owners. Run Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. Okay. So, next topic. Well, actually, no, we've, we've still got to tap onto the second part of that. How do you guys, and I think I know the answer already, but how do you guys feel about the, uh, the Glasgow Rocks keep going on uh, about trying to have the, the league championship delivered to their door? Uh, we'll, we'll start with Daz on this one. Yeah, listen, this isn't a, a pot shot at any club at all, but nobody cares. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, okay? Whoever wins in 19, uh, sorry, 2019, 2020, in any league, in any sport around the world, nobody's going to remember it. Nobody is going to care. Okay? Liverpool are probably going to win the English Premier League football. Nobody cares. I was having this conversation with somebody about American baseball the other day because they're in this mad rush to get back. We've got to get back. We've got, got to play baseball. I love baseball. We're wearing the Red Sox out right now. It doesn't matter. Like, why are we going to put players out there risking their physical <coughs> safety in terms of catching this virus, their physical safety in terms of baseball is a dangerous game, you can break your arm throwing a baseball, for less money, in front of empty arenas, all of this stuff. Why? Nobody's going to care. There's going to be huge asterisks next to it. It's going to be like, oh, Red Sox won, asterisks. It's going to be the same story with the British Basketball League. The season wasn't finished. It's going to be unfinished business for a lot of teams. Nobody's going to respect whoever got given it. If it's Glasgow getting it, because they were top and they were awesome, and who knows what would have happened. Okay, if we could run it through a, a 2K uh, simulator, they may come out on top. It would be amazing. And good for them. They had a great season. But nobody's going to remember this season in a positive way. And if Glasgow raised a banner or whatever would happen, Nobody's going to look at it and be like, oh, that's a legitimate title win. It just makes the, the, the organisation look a little bit, I think, out of touch mm. with the entire world, but especially the national, the national uh, conversation right now. And that's unfortunate because great team, 
great organization, great people, but nobody is going to remember this season fondly. Great job to the, the tournaments that were completed fully, but let's just drop it. For me, just drop it. Like In my head, the 1920 season ended, and it ended on a bum note, ended on a sad note. For me personally, it was the best season of basketball I've ever been involved in. And it's just, unfortunately, other events have taken place. Mm. And we're not going to get a conclusion. So let's just stop talking about awarding a trophy to anybody, accept what it is, and move on to whatever comes forward. Mm. How can you go in the same article? It was It's come from a podcast interview, hasn't it, this article? Yeah, MVP 247, yeah. How can you go in, in one conversation from the league's over, or the league may fold, it may, it may be done, if we don't get this funding to give us a trophy. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the, but, the, um, the, I respect this, it in a way. <laughs> there's, there's two teams. If we're going to, you know, scrape the barrel and say that there are two teams that this season belongs to in the BBL, the only two teams that can rightfully say we're the champions is Worcester and Newcastle because they won their trophies based on. Mm. an entire event taking place it wasn't like they won by default or anything like that there's been great things that have happened this season the fact that Worthy made it to that final against Newcastle you know that'll never be forgotten so, as being so, a great yeah, so, so th there has so, been some some great things that you, you know you can look back at this season as happening but like Das said it's like you know you just kind of want to say just, just let it go just let it go yeah. because they get so they get awarded the, the title. They get awarded BBL title. Like Das says, it's like, well, you know, who, who cares really? You, you know, you didn't you didn't win anything. It's it's a, it's purely hypothetical. There was plenty of season left and plenty of things that could have happened. Mm. So there are too, know, too many teams, aren't there? Too many it. teams fighting for yeah. that top spot. There's like yeah. four teams up there. Maybe even it's five yeah. to bring in. Yeah. And people had played different amounts of games and strength of schedule and I I mean I've said this before I think it's a bit mad that we hand out a league title as well as a playoffs for me it should be one or the other but yeah, exactly. that is, I think that might just be me um, no I agree with and you also that. it was going to be a best of three playoffs that's the oh. real mm. the real tragedy of all this ah, yep. yeah. tragedy of all this but it's the big shame from a sporting contest sort of position have best mm. of three mm. looking forward to that yeah yeah, it, which finally, it, it, it was finally going to happen, and then it got swept away. And it didn't. You know, it's 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 such a shame. Josh, no. final words on this topic. So I'm going to go with see both sides of this. I'm going to give my final opinion at the end. I'm just going to put myself in the perspective of the Scottish Rocks on it. I spoke to somebody about this when the first news came out, where it said on the headline, "I'll fight for us to win the league." Something. And I read that, and I thought that was. I thought that was inappropriate. But speaking to somebody that I know, they said to me, well, he has saved the club from financial instability and he's backed up a squad of predominantly Scottish strong players. Players such as Gareth Murray, Alistair Fraser, Johnny Bunyan, uh, Fraser Malcolm. That itself is a very tough thing to do because we talk about trying to field a BBL team of just British players and we talked about how costly it is and how sometimes it doesn't always work out. Now, let's go to the Scottish Rocks. They first came into the BBL, when was it, 1998, as the Edinburgh Rocks. Do you remember when they had players like Damien Page, Ted Berry? I travelled there one time with the London Towers and away game, and I was very impressed by the support of those Rocks fans. It reminded me of a sort of the Brighton Bears days when before the game, when the game starts, they're standing on their feet to, and they only take the seat when they score the first basket. So you can't deny that the culture of basketball in Scotland it's very, very good because it gives them a sense of national identity being the only Scottish team in sort of the predominantly English-based professional league. So I think there's a sense of pride from the ownership saying, well, we've, we've worked with this club. We've put a lot of money into this club. We deserve what we, we've worked for. However, as admirable as that is, I'm not going to let them get away with that because as both of you have said, I've agreed. I just should just say, drop the league. If you're not going to restart it in June or July and hold something so it's fair, Drop it. And at the end of the day, this is no disrespect 
to anybody in the British basketball league. Because I will repeat, I am a British basketball league fan, all of us are, since the day I was born. But if you win the BBL league, whether it's a coronavirus epidemic or a non-coronavirus epidemic, what do you actually gain financially? What do you gain spiritually? My question. And in a case like this, when the epidemic's out and everybody's been wounded financially, do you really want to hold your head up and say that you are a champion? So I'm going to have to agree with what Dad said on that one. Nobody is going to give two hoots if you're a champion during this epidemic. Drop the league, start it again in June, or just drop the season and we'll start again in August or September if we're allowed to do so. Okay, so moving on, we'll, we'll go to our second topic. The Teesside Lions made uh, the move to hire Mark Sutil last week, which raised some eyebrows at the time. There was a bit of buzz on Twitter about you know the, the, the profile of the guy. He obviously recently coached the GB team to, to an impressive win over Germany. Um, but it turns out they have uh, one eye on the BBL. So their potential there that they've looked at him and... and got him into the T-side lines, and the T-side lines are now looking at jump into the BBL. What do, what do you think about that, fellas? Let's, let's get a, a ads first. I mean, it's, been, um, it's been something that's cropped up a few times in the last year or so, that something in the North East is going to be happening BBL-wise. I was under the impression that um, Durham was going to be the place to, to, to have a BBL franchise. But... Maybe, uh, maybe it's it's this T side to be the one. I mean, I, th I think that something's going to happen up there. I think it's inevitable at some point because they have got such a good, uh, what's the like a good following and participation levels of the sport up there. Um, it's certainly a big enough area to accommodate another team. I'm talking. It's, it's it, it, geographically, it would be a bit like a Manchester and Cheshire type situation mm. so it's not a ridiculous um thing to be to be speculating about at all if anything you know i, I welcome another bbl club i've been saying for a while that the, the league's way short on teams so if there's a sniff of another one joining and it and, it, and it's done right then absolutely why not and with a coach of his kind of caliber you know you're sort of looking <laughs> at it going well are they thinking if we're going to make this move, we want to get get somebody with a good pedigree um, mm. to, to do that job. So maybe we're putting pieces together a little bit, but I, I don't see why that's such a, a crazy rumour, to be honest. And I'm kind of cool with it. The only reservation I had about it was the fact that obviously he did lead the GB team in the last couple of uh, games because Nate Rankin wasn't available. And it's just that kind of thing where the GB setup, it's like, you know, are we going to have part-time commitment to, in terms of the head coaching staff? Makes mm. sense? <clears throat> yeah. Josh, my man. That's not, oh, go oh, on. Sorry. sorry. Daz. You, no, you can go, Daz. Go. I was just going to say that the part-time thing, that's not a big issue to me because um, the last couple of GB head coaches have been split between coaching GB and doing other other teams coaching and if they're based in within the FIBA the FIBA family the FIBA window then it's absolutely not a problem because they'll be available when they need to be and they'll be obviously splitting their time between focusing on the T-side lines and focusing on GB when need be um, you know we don't want to see a situation like we had with uh, Tony oh, Tony um, Scalato oh, I... Tony Garbaletto Garbaletto so, I'm, I don't know what happened now I'm really sorry it's early on a Sunday. I do apologise. I know Tony totally Babalow. <laughs> Matt him. He's a great man. He's currently uh, pushing Japan. He's doing a great job. Anyway. Um, yeah. Don't get too much on. But two clubs or a club and a national team, it's not a problem. So long as it's within that FIBA time frame. Josh, my man. Well, the thing about T-side, it's the Mohawks they're called, isn't it? Lions, Lions. Lions, yeah. Well, Teesside's got a rich history of basketball tradition. There was a player who played in the early days who once played in the NBA. I think his name is Tony Hansen. He might have passed away, I think. I'm not sure. Um, but oh, he the Bulls, was... The Bulls player. Yeah, or was it the New Orleans Jazz? I can't remember. Was it Tony Hansen? It rings a bell, yeah. Yeah, he had a son that was my used to play. I, 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 I'm not sure if he passed away or not. I think he did, but 
rest his soul, but he was a phenomenal sort of figure in the influence in basketball in Teesside. And he developed a very strong National League Division One team over the years. He was also a very fantastic player in basketball in Teesside. Now, for them to go on the BBL, yeah, I support that. You need, you need teams to come up. Some of them in the league, well, it doesn't work like that in the first year. They've got to adapt to the league as time goes on. We saw this with Plymouth Raiders in 2004 when they first joined the league. It took some years, and then eventually they were able to mix it up with the big boys. However, going on to the topic for basketball in the Northeast, if you really want to start a new sort of brand, a new sort of franchise or foundation in the Northeast, I'm telling you that let's all agree that the biggest team in the Northeast is the Newcastle Eagles, correct? Yeah. Okay. A team that takes us pride from being a Geordie based fan base, a, a Geordie identity. And I'm telling you, I think if I am a, a philanthropist or thinking about sort of starting a basketball program or a basketball advocate, I'm going to Sunderland. I'll tell you why. I'm going to build a team that works at the local schools, works at the universities, build a foundation, and that plays in the rival colours, red and white, to what Newcastle are. By doing that, you have one team up the road that is based of Geordies, and then there's the other team down the road in the space of Mackens. That could really boost the profile of the league, boost, uh, boost another rivalry of the league in terms of the long-term effect, but it has to be done the right way. Now, going on to Mark Stutel. <clears throat> if this was a few years ago, and he had been hired as head coach, people probably would have raised their eyebrows to say, well, he has no BBL experience, but he's taken a GB spot. However, the current climate, I think it's his appointment is the best thing. Now, I'm not sure if he's still the assistant coach or if he's taken over from Ryan King, but number one, Ryan King's not going to be available, okay? The speculation that he might even become the next Cleveland Cavaliers coach because he's with their current G League team. And even when he's in the G League, he's unable to come over for the qualifying windows for the upcoming Eurobasket. So if I'm GB... Give the jump to Mark Studel. You've got really nothing to lose. You could see in the way he coaches. He's a very passionate, very energetic player, and he really uh, a coach. Sorry, and he likes to motivate his players. However, him being with the T side, um, is, you say Eagles, it was or Mohawks, Lions, Lions. Sorry, completely off. Um, <laughs> the T side uh, Lions. I think this is great because this is also a great chance for him to sort of build his legacy for what he wants to do as a coach. He could probably build this franchise into a very, very strong program. And that would be good for him, but it would also be good for him to develop being the next young GB coach. Do you guys think there's an element that, um, obviously, they've managed to get March due to? He's, he's kind of made himself higher profile because of how well GB did. And obviously, he was given that role to, to run the GB squad in the absence of, of Nate Rankin. Um, Teesside Lions must have had an idea of going into the BBL before they brought him in. Do you think bringing him in kind of cements that fact? Because the, the, the kind of raised eyebrows on Twitter were like, why is, why is a coach of that stature going down to that kind of level? Go on, Daz, yeah. Um, I, I don't know how saying that kind of level, it's kind of dismissive of... D3. D3 is a ridiculously competitive standard of basketball in this guy. I, I, I mean, just for me, I know, Ads, you, do you have some dealings with D3? Oh, you do with Bury. Absolutely. The spinners, and you just said it, it's a, a very, very tough competitive league. I mean, our guy Greg is a, a D3 <laughs> yeah. coach, you know? Yeah, and I'm thinking of, again, the likes of Barry Powell, uh, Matt Harbour, who could be coaching at a higher level than D3 if we're going to, you know, go by this pyramid tier system. But I know, for example, Matt, he's gone to, wait for it, wait for it. It's been a while, Anglia Ruskin, <laughs> to start something, to start a big program, start a big movement, okay? Barry Powell, same with Northampton Titans. They're, they're a big program, they're a big movement. They're looking to climb through the ladder. If you listen to my interview with uh, Will Reed on Focus Hoops. Um... And so even if it's not about getting straight to the BBL, maybe it is about building a big culture. Because, again, you just look at the pictures, you look at the video of, of the clubs up there, and the fans are packing it out. And it's D3. It's brilliant. Very passionate support up in, in the Northeast. And we were talking about Northeast earlier. Or at least I was. The basketball culture there is amazing. It's fantastic. And it's, it's growing. So maybe this is about a jump to BBL straight away. If so, cool. I'm here for more teams in the BBL. I think 
we all are, so long as it's done properly and sustainably. But if it isn't, he's going into a real, really, really competitive basketball situation. And again, it's it's a platform to maybe build him as a coach, build his profile, and maybe bring through the next crop of young English northeastern players. And I'm I'm all for it. You've kind of answered, I was going to throw it out to the group as to whether it was too much of a jump to go from D3 to uh, BBL, but that's kind of been shot down, hasn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, not necessarily. It, it's, it's a funny one because, I mean, this it would be great to actually, you know, to have Greg's take on this, being a, a D3 coach that obviously has, has done great things in his first year with the spinners, to get his take on it. But... It, it comes down to a few, I mean, the, how can I put this? To make that jump, you would have to be pretty confident in yourself to be able to do it because it is, it is a, a big jump because it's not just the fact that you're dealing with a different level of basketball. You're dealing with a different level of athlete and of personalities as well. So, you know, you, you, your man management skills are going to be very different because, you, you know, you're dealing with imported players from different countries. You know, you've got different egos involved. You've got players that might have been superstars in college or in Europe. You know, you've got the man management side of it's going to be important. Many, many people on paper are qualified, you know, level three or above basketball coaches. But the personality of the coach and what they're made up of in that point of view is ultimately what's going to make them or break them at the highest level. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of dismissive to say, oh, you know, dropping down to that level, this, that, and the other. You know, it's, it's a difficult thing. And some coaches want to start at D3 and work the way up to, to, to BBL level. But the other thing we've got to remember is as well is that with basketball in this country, you know, only a handful of people are fortunate enough, and that's coaches, players, whatever, to be able to make a living purely out of being professionally tied to basketball as a coach or a player. So you've got to be kind of looking at the life situation for that coach as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's situational, isn't it, as much as anything when you talk about British basketball in general, isn't it, at that kind of... Thing. Any any last words on this topic before we move on from anybody? Uh, not really. It just it just makes sense from where he's been, what he's done in his career up in in the north northeast. With he's been head coach of Northumbria since 2010. So you know mm. how much of a jump is it going to be for him? It's not. He's coached you know elite level athletes for over a decade. Um, or at least very high level uh, uh, university bucks level athletes who probably comprise some elite players as well if it works the same as what it works for a lot of places down south and like you were saying ads you know how is he going to cope with ego and superstars i mean he's coached obi soka he's coached dan clark like um, i'm not saying those are big egos <laughs> by the way i'm not saying they're like egotists or anything like that but they are like two of the best players that this country's mm -hmm. produced in however long you want to say. So, it's, it'll be fine. Cool. Okay. Last cool. thing about his role for GB, and just to sort of elaborate on what Daz said, for GB to qualify for the next Eurobasket, okay, they won against um, Germany, which was a, was a good win for them. They came close on the road against Montenegro, but Mark Studo has to make sure that whatever his plans are, whether he's to go on as the head coach or whatever role he's going to have, Dan Clark must be instrumental to those plans. Dan Clark is what now, he's one year older than me, he's six foot ten, he's a predominant power forward that can shoot the ball really well from the perimeter, but he must keep Dan Clark along because that is your most experienced player, that is the player that can really help the younger players come through the GB ranks, and you need him in the mix as much as possible. Yeah, we could talk about Obi Soko, he's a fantastic player, he'll be more the go-to player for GB, but having those two players, along with Gabe Olesheny, as well as the backcourt, he must keep that core together because that was a problem this team had in the FIBA World Cup qualifiers in the build-up to China, where they only won one game. The squad, the coaching changes, just kept happening too much, and that was very detrimental to the squad's success. He must keep this squad together going into the next two or three windows. Fair point. 
Right, game on. Let's go. Last topic of the uh, of the show. Uh, some good news for the BBL potentially. Skylar White could be back. In recent comments between him and the Surrey Scorchers on Instagram, uh, Instagram, sorry, Skylar White referred to needing to keep it at the sports park for a while with one of them emojis doing that. What do we think of that? That's uh, we don't often get kind of insight as to where players are going to go. We get a lot of rumor. This obviously is kind of rumor, but it's actually from the source this time. What do we think, Ads? Let's go to you. I mean, we, we touched on it in the, in the last show, um, what will happen with, with players, with it being a season that was cut short. Is there going to be players and clubs that are going to want to try and keep the nucleus of what they were, uh, how they were playing last year together? So is this going to mean that we might just see players returning to the same club? Because um, a lot of players will look at it as, right, it's unfinished business. You know, we didn't get to see this thing through. Certainly for the teams other than... Um, Worcester and Newcastle that have won trophies already. You know, so certainly up in Scotland, there'll be players wanting to, to come back and, and, and finish a job. It's the same at the other end of the table. I mentioned it last time, Delvin Dickerson desperate to, to come back to, to the UK and, and specifically play in Manchester, which would be a great thing. And, you know, it's good that the players, you know, and Skyler's been the first one to sort of openly, you know, drop a bit of a a nugget in there because it's it's nice when players do that. It, it gives it gives the fans something to focus on and maybe look forward to. He was a real talent as well, Daz. What's your opinions? Yeah, great. Um, Hope comes back. He's real talent in this league. Really enjoyed commentating uh, the game he played against the Lions. Um, yeah, let's run it. I think, like I'd said, a lot of there's going to be a lot of unfinished business. Uh, all throughout all of the leagues and especially the BBL um, and teams will want to if they've had success they're probably going to want to run it back to a large extent definitely try and do that but there's as we see every year there's going to be a lot of change a lot of upheaval but I think it's so important um, I, I don't know how you feel about this is now again we've covered this even though you've tried to to snake me out on the YouTube Adam uh, sorry not Adam uh, Pablo I remember this you and your wacky bands. But I'm not a fan of a team. But I am a fan of this, this team. <laughs> this, this beautiful Racing Club Derby Shineda. And the thing that is really important to me as a sports fan is continuity year on year. It's a great thing about, you know, Racing Club, the basketball and the football. There's a lot of similar players coming through. And commentating the Lions and covering the Lions like I have the last couple of years, it's been great to see a real continuity. And I think that's really important for fans now I could be wrong but seeing the same faces year in year out with you know a few players come in and a few players go out but generally you want to keep that core and if the Surrey uh, Scorchers can make Skylar White part of their core going forward that would be amazing for, for them and also for the fans and of course for the league as well because he's such a talented uh, player but yeah continuity for me has always been key in a lot of things especially uh, the success of sports teams Absolutely. Josh, my man, bring us home. Well, the first time I saw Skylar White play was at Crystal Palace. It was probably October. Then they played at Surrey Sports Park for uh, two more times. And I'd heard a lot about Skylar White before this game. I read his stats. You know, he played in Portugal the year prior to this season where he put up some good numbers. Now, <clears throat> as a the mistake I usually make as a basketball fan is you can't see someone play once, twice, or three times and really make a thorough opinion of them, especially at the professional level. Those three games that I saw Skylar White play weren't his most effective games. He didn't produce a lot in those games. However, I have come to my assumption of Skylar White when I traveled to the uh, Copper Box one evening to watch Surrey um, score just play against the London Lions. Skylar White is a fantastic player. Number one is he's a very effective player that can play against any kind of zone, whether it's a 3-2 zone or a 2-3 zone especially in the fact that he can play at the high post. He can also run baseline to baseline because he is such a good shooter. If you watch the way Skylar White gets a shot off, he gets it off very quickly. And also, his jump shot's very hard to block because he has such a high release above his head. When he's making shots, he becomes a very dominant player. In that game at the Copper Box, I think he had seven three-pointers and single-handedly brought Surrey Scorchers back in the game. I'm looking at his stats this year, he's one hell of a rebounder as well, especially going for offensive rebounds. You look at him, he's got such a very long wingspan. Now, if I'm correct, he's a dual nationality. Is that correct? 
Well, I'm not sure about that. Yes, I think yeah. you're right. So he is American British. I think it won't be a problem retaining him. I think it will be in his best interest to come back to the British Basketball League. I mean, he had a very good season. Stats is the biggest thing when you're a professional. If you look at his stats this season compared to what, it, what they were in Portugal, they're very strong. He's averaging 15, 14 points per game. If I'm Skylar White, I'm going back to Surrey Sports Park. I'm doing one more year, maybe two more years with the Scorchers, and then see where your stats take you after that. If you want to stay in the BBL, by all means, he, he can play in the BBL. He's a very, very good player. But I think the BBL is a great outlet for him to be here and to keep putting those numbers up while he's here to see where he can go for the future. Where would you put him, just, just out of interest? Um, well, sorry, go with ads. For, have we done ads? Ads? No, I, I was just going to say that the only thing that we've not touched on is what, what's a, 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 going to be an interesting story to unfold is the fact that with the new rules that we were discussing yesterday about the, the, the four players and everything, I mean, realistically, are the clubs going to be able to afford to bring in four players like of that? Type, well, he's uh, he's a, an, uh, he could be an exception because, as I understand yeah. it, there's, there's a salary cap at two hundred thousand. You can have two English if he's dual nationality and he, he counts as as British. You can have two British told. players that don't count in that cap, so he could be one of those players. And then you mm. can, you know, you're, you're still working off off a, a blank sheet, if you know what I mean. Can I just confirm with this with this four? Is this four Americans or is this four non-British players? It's five. I think it's gone to five non-British or European and four of them can be American. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Right. I, don't, I really don't think we're going to see many clubs that have four Americans next season, though. I just think financially they're not going to be in a position yeah. to do it. It'll take time to get back to normality, I think. Yeah. But by the time yeah. that money comes back, at least the rule's there. But like you've already alluded to, there's a lot of unfinished business. So the, the, I would suggest the chances of most of the teams bringing back the nucleus of players they had last year potentially fairly high. Mm. I'd say so. In terms of, of Skylar White, just quickly, is he, would he make your, uh, your... This is off the cuff. Apologies. Would he make your BBL, uh, your all-BBL team for the last season? Right and right. Say again? Are you saying the winning five? five? Yeah, five? yeah, yeah. Mm. Ads, and, ads and Darren go first. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's just going. Uh, <laughs> I can't. I'm trying to remember who even played in the league last year. It's been that long. <laughs> I've, been, I've been through starting fives. I've, every time I get asked, I'll probably give you a different five. I don't think so. I think he's kind of sixth man or, or thereabouts. Um... What's his listed position, power forward? He is, but he's so versatile, isn't he? Power forward, but then again, I'd say Kai Williams is a better player. Ooh, interesting. Kai Williams is six foot seven, six eight. He can elevate very high when he, he's more of a jump shooter. It's not that he's miles better than Skylar White. It's just the fact Kai Williams is probably just offers a little bit more as as a small forward such power forward. Don't get me wrong, Skylar White is a very good player, but. I've got to take, and then there's Jamal. There's um, Jamal Williams as well, Kai's brother. So it's a there's a lot of competition at that position right now in the British Basketball League. So I mean, even Jordan Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jordan Williams for me is more of a he's a good friend. I mean, I, I absolutely love Jordan Williams, but Jordan Williams for me is more of a back down. He's an undersized centre, but he's possibly <laughs> the strongest post player in the British Basketball League. That's where he likes to uh, likes to work, isn't it? Maybe, maybe, maybe I reshuffle that slightly. I would like to see if we had one a traditional All Star game. I would like to see somebody like Skylar White in that, and in a three point shoot competition oh, as well. Yeah, he'd be he'd, he'd, be, in, he'd be in the All Star game. Yeah, mm. he'd be in the All Star team. Don't yeah, he'd be an All Star in this league. I don't well, know let's, if he's all BBL position. We've mentioned Kai Williams, Jamal Williams. Who else is a small forward? Who do the London Lions have at that position? Brandon Peel. Uh, Ovi Soko. Soko is again more of a post player, I'd say. He's, he's more of, he's a, a, he's more of a, a point four. <laughs> I'd say he's more of a he really, four. What, uh, he got played at five. He's not a five. He's a four. He's a four, three. Yeah, who can, he's four. expanded his range. His role is, his role for what he does at Lions, Brandon Pill is more effective in and around the basket. I'm not saying that he can't handle the ball, but for, for a big man, he can run the floor like a deer, but 
if, if you want to know where the, the majority of his points come from, he is just such an effective player 10 feet around the basket. So you're right, he's a power forward, but he's a four-stretch five, I think. I wouldn't say Brandon Pills a small forward. I would, I would argue that he is versatile enough to play small forward. I, thought, I felt a little bit last season that Ovi Soko and the, the pair of them had a, had a similar kind of role on the team and maybe you had one in or the other, depending on who was performing. You know, Vince will put in who's performing yeah, in that game. Yeah, and that's kind of how it went. And especially once they brought in um, Boy Touch, uh, mm. that, really, that really broke up that, that pairing. And again, Boy Touch, power forward. Uh, power forward, small forward? Small, small forward guard, I would have said. Two guard forward. Guard forward. Somewhere between two to four. Yeah. He, he played anywhere from two to four. I think we've established there's a lot of versatility in, versatility in the BBL, yeah. All right, fellas, we'll wrap things up. Um, thanks very much for being on the show again. Ads, cheers, buddy. Daz, my man, thanks for coming back, bruv. Yeah, boy touch, listed as a guard. From Ethiopia, USA. Loyola Morimount. 24 years old. Born in Addis Ababa. Grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> this, is, this is what the peak of uh, performance looks like. If ever there was a great way <sighs> for, for Daz to reintroduce himself, is that you're saying, thanks for coming on, Daz, see you next time. <laughs> and he's in his own little world and his notes like that going, ah, actually, I know, Daz. <laughs> You the man. Oh, cheers, Daz. Yeah, cheers, Daz. It's good to be good to be back. Good to be home. And Josh, my man. Thanks again. Good chat. All right, boys. See you guys in a bit. I will be back soon. So just watch this space. <laughs>